Hey everybody, this is the Sliders Review. And since it's Women's History Month, I'm here today to talk to you about Cleopatra 2525, the series rundown review. So Cleopatra 2525 was an extremely fun, high octane adventure action pack show. It lasted for two seasons. It came out in 2000, uh, well, 2000, <laughs> and ended in 2001. I almost said 2020 because I'm so used to saying that. <laughs> but it came out in 2000. This came out when I was still in high school. And so I talked briefly about this show, but this show basically is just a huge Matrix ripoff. Like everything that makes the Matrix Matrix um, is putting in this. Not everything, but some things. Uh, like the whole red pill, blue pill thing is not in here. But basically, it's just like the Matrix was like really, really huge at that time. And so. Uh, Robert Tabbert, the dude who um, normally does like Hercules and Xena type shows, and his friend like R.J. Stewart, they decided, hey, let's capitalize on that. I believe Sam Raimi might have been the overall like producer of the show. So basically, it was filmed in New Zealand, and when it lasted for two seasons, the first season was like 20 minutes long. 20, 30 minutes, like your typical like type show, um, like 20 to 30 minutes. But then once, because this used to play back to back with that of um, Jack of All Trades. Jack of All Trades lasted for two seasons too, but it ended earlier. So its time slot was added on to that Cleopatra to where it made it an hour or show or 40 minutes, if you will. So towards the like, second half of the second season became like hour long shows. And the show is about a group of freedom fighters who is trying to, an all-female group of freedom fighters, who is trying to take the world back from that of the robots and stuff. They live underground, just like in the Matrix and stuff. And so, like, so it, it was filmed in New Zealand, and it, the, the outfits were very futuristic um, inspired, like midriffs, leather, um, you know, like, like something you would expect, like, in a a futuristic sci-fi imaginary setting, you know what I'm saying? And so it had locks of action. It had flips. It had like it, it, it's so interesting. Like this show should have never like existed with all the kookiness that went on with it, but it did, and it made it that much funner and stuff. Now, see if you were to watch shows of today, the way they set today, and try to watch this. You might not like it, but if you grew up with stuff like Hercules and Xena and Action Pack type stuff and um, like, um, oh, I'm trying to think of something, uh, episodic type stuff, then you might really enjoy this. This is just one of those things that's just so interesting. You have to watch at least once and everything, you know? And so, like, I'm trying to think. Um, so these group of machines, they don't look like the Matrix machines because, you know, they're on a TV budget, but they still look good nevertheless. And the CGI budget was pretty impressive and everything. Like, I really give it up for them and stuff. And so basically what happened is at some point in time, after the year, like, 2000, machines took over the Earth for some reason. And it drove humanity underground. And so... And they're in the year 2525, which is why it's called Cleopatra 2525. So when they went underground, a bunch of people built like what's known as the shafts. They built like underground homes for everybody down below. And all these type of like, you know, shafts and everything like you'll see like in, uh, in that building and stuff. And it's pretty impressive what they built. Like it goes on for miles and miles and miles and stuff. And so like... One cool thing about the aesthetic look of this is that when they are underground, because they rarely go to the surface, when they are underground, it's very dark, dingy, grimy, like they live in a dystopia. They live in an apoc uh, apocalyptic type world. So, you know, everything's dirty, is grimy. There are like bits and pieces of like brick and cave looking stuff. Like it, it looks the way you would think if humanity built a society underground. And of course, like, you know, to reinforce like the underground, they built like walls and floors, which are called um, like the shafts and stuff like that. 
So it's all like this hard like metal and it's like dingy looking. I really appreciate the look. However, in the second season, things started to get a bit cleaner at times. Not every time, but sometimes. Sometimes when you go into a certain building or a room, it was way too clean looking and polished, especially like heightened security places, laboratories, stuff like that. Um, so they made sure they kept that hygienic and stuff for those laboratories makes sense. Um, but I, and I guess like the person who's kind of like a mayor, sheriff type person, she had a pretty clean place too. When they started going into those rooms that were very brightly lit, the show just felt different, but they didn't always keep that. Now, the people on the underground, there's no real system of law. Pretty much you can just do whatever you want. Um, and there really are no hierarchies. So it's like everybody is like divided, kind of like it would be in a post-apocalyptic thing where there are these certain subgroups and this and that. Now, there are some people who live underwater and everything, underwater in these like, um, like domes and buildings and stuff and they have separated themselves from people up there underground they feel like they are more sophisticated they have um better technology and since they've been underwater with all the pressure for so long their lungs can adapt better kind of like aquaman type thing but they do not like the rest of the underground to the point where they just like aquaman's um brother try to take over that land and stuff and flood the um underground shafts now there is another group of people we found in this Christmas type episode. These people live in a part of underground where they have really good hollow technology. And they basically made their underground look like it's that of Earth back in like the 90s and stuff. And that's where they live their lives and everything. And it's fake snow that's holograms. And so, but then everybody else just lives in the other part where everybody is like scamming and scheming and trying to take over and stuff. Now, just like with any kind of sci-fi thing and people living underground, you're going to have mutations. And in the first episode, we see some people who are mutated. And in fact, they might not even be people. They might be mutated animals for all we know. We see a um, snake man with a snake head and we see a cat man and they are very much mutated. Now, mutants, we don't really see that much in the show, but those are full on mutants. Chances are they probably are animals that got mutated. I mean, that's something you expect with sci-fi. But there are human mutants as well, and they just look like, kind of like the mutants from Batman The Dark Knight Returns. Um, remember the comic and everything, had the mutants look? They kind of look like that. Uh, so they had like this, their the skin is boily and everything, and scrapes, and these weird piercings and stuff like that. And just like with the underground, there are like clubs and stuff. And in the clubs, you know, they have to, because they don't have food from the, 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 the surface no more. They have to grow their own stuff underground and eat what's ever down there. And they have to create their own alcoholic drinks and stuff. And their own hallucinates and drugs and everything like that. And so throughout the first season, we learn a lot about like the society down there in the clubs. And there's also sadly slave trades where a bunch of like mutants, they kidnap a bunch of like men and women and they sell them as sex slaves and everything. So it's very corrupt down there. So I'm glad it's not like a utopia and everything. It's a dystopia because you want to see the harsh realities of what the machines have done to humanity. And so on the surface, there are still actually people living there. These people are brainwashed into thinking that the machines are like a higher power of life and they're there to ascend them into greatness and everything. What these machines do is that they have these people willingly sacrifice themselves going into like this machine chamber thinking they're going to a higher enlightenment where their bodies are actually cloned and turned into betrayer robots. Now the betrayer robots are like the agents of the matrix, but they have the appearance in their liquid metallic form as like the, what is that thing called from Terminator? The, the, the second Terminator movie, the X thousand or something like that. The one that turns like a liquid metallic substance um, from T2. Um, it looks like him in this metallic form. However, it takes the appearance of whatever human it cloned itself to be. And so it looks like a normal human until it can do two different modes. It can go into this metallic mode that's full on metallic and shoots laser out of his eyes or it's in this human betrayal form where it just has these giant like laser cannon guns on their forearms and it's really cool looking 
and these betrayer robots they have the memories of that of the human but they're evil and stuff it is later found out that these but uh, um bailey robots that what the machines are called baileys and everything they are techno organic based they derive from humans because some person created them but we didn't know who at that time but then in the final episode it is later revealed who exactly built them and everything and the purpose of why he built them and so let's put a pin in that for now now just like in the matrix they are led by a mysterious woman this woman is known as the voice and all you do is hear her voice throughout the entire series and we never see her until the final episode and she has a bunch of freedom fighter groups one group in particular is the one we focus in on the show is Hal's group now these freedom fighters they pretty much they um gather as much information as they can from the baileys and the betrayers they upgrade their weapons to be able to fight the baileys and stuff because they are gonna stage a full out war with the machines it's gonna be humanity's last like stand and everything so these groups are gathering as much information as they can much of their weaponry their technology so they can enhance their um like force field shields and their lasers and their scanners and stuff and they have these weapons on their um, forearms, which in the form of gauntlets. These gauntlets can scan, they can shoot lasers, um, they can do all kind of all right, stuff, you know. Now, the only person who can hear the voice is the team leader. So she controls many teams and talks to them individually. It's not like a board queen type thing where she hears everybody's thoughts. She just talks to people individually. And these teams don't know the other teams until they are uh, later on found out. And so Hal assumed that her group was the only group at that time. And so like at one point in time, Hal's group, they fight a betrayer robot because one of their team members turned on a Horace turns out to be one in the pilot episode. And so they fight him throughout the entire episode because he's tracking them down and stuff. And once they a betrayer knows where they live at they have to get rid of their headquarters blow it up and find another one and so there are no doors down there in the future they just have holographic doors so you assume it's part of like a wall but you can just phase through it and so mauser who is a former betrayer robot he is part of hal's team because she reprogrammed him and he is the one who integrates the betrayer technology into their gauntlet so they can have a fighting chance and so Hal's team does a lot in this series. They are able to find like an old, like kind of like race car hovercraft type system where they're able to use its technology and its system to help fight the Baileys and stuff. At some point in time, they recover. Um, Cause see, there's a reason why the Baileys don't go underground. One, they too big. So they send in like betrayer robots, but there's another reason why there's a defense system. Um, that the earth underground has that these people known as the shaft builders um, um, created they create these ginormous cannon guns that shoots out laser blasts that can take down a bailey and taking down a bailey is very hard you can shoot it with your gauntlet all you want but she ain't gonna take it out but these cannon guns can take them down in the brink of an eye and that is the main reason why they don't go down underground and one bailey who got very stubborn decided screw it i'm gonna go down there and chase after these people and that's when they found out about the shaft cannons and stuff so at some point they integrate that technology and use it to put on their tanks when they stage like a last battle and stuff um we also get to see how the like betrayer robots are made how they are cloned and this and that and so it's a really interesting show the only problem i have with it is the finale episode the finale episode was a bottle episode a recap episode with new ep with new footage put in there and the final battle was very quick we see our heroes standing on the surface and boom we just see weapons shooting fire going everywhere we see the humans in their gauntlets shooting at the betrayers we see the betrayers um shooting at the humans we see the baileys in the sky we see the giant shaft cannon shooting baileys down and it happens all within like 10 15 20 seconds and then it's all cgi it looks like a video game 
and it really bugs me because I wanted to see this battle happen. I wanted to know if the humans are going to survive and destroy the machines, you know? It ended on a huge cliffhanger. Nobody knows how this thing was going to end, you know what I'm saying? But it was nice to see a glimpse of the battle. I just wish I could have seen like a whole lot more of it, you know what I'm saying? And so like now this show is a bit campy at times. It, it has humor. It, I mean, it's made from Robert Tabor. <laughs> you know how he is. Um, the Evil Dead series, Hercules and Xena, Jack of All Trades. So <laughs> it's going to have that camp in there. The campiness might take you out a little bit, but I think the action should like keep you in and stuff. Now let's get down to some characters. We have the team leader herself, Hal, played by Gina Torres. Now, all of the people you see on this show have appeared either on Hercules or Xena, but as minor characters or recurrent. She was a recurring one on Hercules as Nebula, and she appeared once as Cleopatra in Xena. That's what threw me off. I assumed when I heard about this show and knew she was going to be in there, I assumed she was going to play Cleopatra, but she didn't. Now, Hal is very interesting. Hal keeps around with her um, a piece of wood. And inside that wood is a picture of her father. Wood is very priceless down there in the underworld because many people have not seen it. And so how father was believed to be dead. I've already explained this episode. So she believed her father died by the hands of Krieg and everybody did. But he actually went into the actual plane. And so he's able to phase in and out until Kriegen finally killed him for real. She is a very headstrong, capable leader who does what the voice wants her to but she does start to question the motives of the voice and that irritates the voice sometimes but she starts to question her once she realizes that the voice has been lying to her and keeping secrets so this is what causes her to disobey the order sometimes of like the voice she's highly capable in fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat she knows how to do flips and acrobatics and everything she relies on her team to help get things done because she can't do her own but she is part of like that that that, that uh, force that helps her team out and everything she there's a really interesting episode, that christmas episode the one with the holograms and stuff i told you in there she's looking for another team leader and he's been hurt by a betrayer robot. The betrayer robot has disguised itself as a man who is the father and wife of a girl they don't know that and so he kills the other team leader. She kills the betrayer robot to the point where she almost dies, but then Sarge has to help her and save her. When the woman tells her, like, how will we get past this? Well, I'm supposed to tell my daughter that was her father. And he acted like her father. He didn't try to hurt them whatsoever. But when he saw team members, he tried to kill and attack them. And she tells him, just remember the great man that he used to be and remind her daughter of that and stuff. And that's all she needs to hold on to the memory of him and stuff. And so Cregan is her arch, uh, arch enemy. She hates him to death because she thinks he killed her father. And so, like, she is like Batman and Bat. It's like Batman and Joker. The reason why, because he looks like the Joker. I'll get into him a little bit later. And so, like, she keeps her team in check. She makes sure Sarge doesn't like being postal because Sarge is the like hothead of the group. And she keeps Cleo safe because Cleo is... I'll get into her a little bit later. <laughs> now, Mauser, he's played by Robert Cake. And he is a former Betrayer robot that's been reprogrammed. He is the brains of the group. He's the technological dude. He can like do it all, you know what I'm saying? And he is very loyal to that of the voice and that of how. Now every team leader, like I said before, can hear the voice in their head because of uh, uh, a chip that they implant in the head. Now he also has one too. Um, at one point in time, he goes rogue because Sarge decided she was going to use him as a sex robot because Sarge is Sarge. <laughs> and she reactivated his betrayer programming to the point where his original mission was to discover the voice and kill her. So he goes back on that mission with the help of another betrayer robot. But it also reactivates his memories of the past that's been dormant, that of his wife, Clara. And... Uh, 
And so he goes looking for her. When they find her, they assume that she is the voice and everything. But it turns out she's not. Until he actually starts going after the voice. And then they stop him before he's able to get inside the voice's room. And when we see the voice's headquarters, my God, it is cool. It's this giant machine on a cliff with all this holographic systems of all the teams and stuff. And this is when Hal discovers that the voice has been keeping a secret. She knows Cregan back when, before he started looking like a clown. Sarge, played by Victoria Pratt. Now, Sarge, she guest starred on Xena as uh, Cyan in that two-part episode when Xena was looking for Gabrielle, when she thought Gabrielle was dead. And so, Sarge is the muscle of the group. She's the sex-crazed one of the group, and she is the hothead of the group. She is very angry and everything, and does not like Cleopatra when she first meets her. Because Cleopatra is so nice and, and sweet and everything. Sarge is the type of person that if she don't like you, she will straight up punch you without even thinking twice. And she used to be part of this thing called the Watch. The Watch are a bunch of bad people who steal from other like people in the underground and try to like sell uh, to the highest bidder and stuff. She later got out of that and started working for the voice once Hal saved her life. Now Sarge only has one kidney, so when she meets uh, when she gets attacked by the betrayer of Horus and everything, she loses her other kidney and has to get like um, surgery repaired. That's when they meet Cleopatra. Sarge, like, Cleopatra ended up bringing out the best in Sarge. She made her somewhat nicer, somewhat, <laughs> and everything. It's to the point where, because see, the thing about Sarge and Hal is like... They have one mission, one mission only. Retake the surface. They don't care what else is going on in the underground. And Cleopatra changes all that with them. And so Sarge's name used to be Rose because she used to live in a um, up on the surface with the rest of the brainwashed people. She has a sister. They name everybody after flowers. Her sister' name is Lily. Her sister, had, uh, Sarge, has to go on a mission to infiltrate like the Bailey um, headquarters, see how they're made and everything. And so, and betrayers and stuff. So she meets Lily. She does not like Lily. She hates her sister because her sister is brainwashed. She tries to talk some sense into her sister, but her sister does not want to hear it. Her sister and Cleopatra end up getting taken by the Baileys and Sarge is so pissed. She's all like, when I find my sister, I will murder her because she took Cleopatra. This is when she started liking Cleopatra and stuff. Hal is trying to tell her, look, man, if I could be with my father, this is before she found out her father's alive, I would. And your sister is the only living family you got. You need to forgive her. You need to understand she is brainwashed and everything. So Sarge pretends to get infiltrated into like the Bailey headquarters. She's supposed to get cloned. She ends up at first smacking her sister around and literally about to kill her until her sister starts pleading with her talking about like i'm sorry you try to tell me the truth and i wouldn't listen to all this other stuff she has a change of heart and so after that her sister was supposed to join the group but never did and her sister never appeared again to the second season uh, apparently her sister's just been wandering around by herself and sarge has been too busy like saving like the underworld so that part of the storyline i never liked because it's kind of like how was her sister able to integrate underground by herself you know and so they never really focused that much on that and that really bugged me now cleopatra is very interesting cleopatra is not from the year 2525 she's from the year 2000 basically she was a stripper who went in to get a boob job and got allergic to the anesthetic and had to be placed in a um, cryo chamber until they could find a cure for her so when sarge needed a new kidney they went down into this kind of like dirty hospital type place where the mutants gave her a new kidney and they found Cleopatra. The dude was all like, oh yeah, she's still frozen. I'm just gonna like, you know, um, watch my call him, um, play with her a little bit later or something like that. Like, but, and then, so when she wakes up, she's one of the type of people who wanted to be an actress. So she thinks like she's playing, like pretending everything. And they're kind of like, are you serious? Like what's this and what's a cow and what's a spy and who's James Bond and all this other stuff. And so she did all that to um, get 
get herself out of that situation because she just woke up in the middle of like freaky town and everything not knowing what the world's going on and then here comes horus and everything and only attack as a betrayer robot in his liquid uh, metallic form she is freaking out because well first before he turned liquid metallic he has a giant hole in his stomach um in his human form and then he reconstitutes himself into his liquid form she is freaking out um and everything like that so she later joins Hal and them group they feel they feel kind of bad for her plus she saved sarge life because the thing the betrayer robot wanted to kill sarge and she was able to mimic sarge's voice and throw him off and so she joins and later joins the group but she never fights she doesn't even get like gauntlets to like shoot lasers and stuff and so basically she's just there to kind of like be a moral compass to like the group and bring out the best in them because they only have one mission to retake the surface but when they meet her she got them to do a whole lot more she saved a slave girl from like the mutants she rescued like a baby that was like had a bomb inside of them she helped them remember what it was like to be human and everything and that you know Part of taking back the surface world means um, taking back the underworld and protecting those that still live in the underworld. If everybody's too busy killing each other and selling each other, then what's the point in going back to the surface when nobody's going to be there because everybody's too busy killing each other, you know? So she was literally the moral compass of, like, everybody and helped them be better people and stuff. And so there's one episode where she's in this holographic system where we get to see what her life was like in the year 2000 and her boyfriend and stuff. And it turns out that her boyfriend rigged the system so that they can live their lives in virtual reality. And then when he wakes up, he's an old man now because he got thawed out before she did and he went looking for her and stuff. And so it broke her heart. Now she did get cloned into a betrayer robot, but her betrayer robot thought it was literally human and stuff. It's a very touching episode. And so Cleo was was instrumental to the group. She was able one time when they went into the underworld on uh, water uh, facility. They shot down a Bailey. The the water people did, and it made contact with her. Well, she was able to communicate with it. And that proved to be useful as other C uh, other episodes came by when, like, you know, being connected to the Baileys and be able to understand them and, like, stuff like that. Now, she is later given gauntlets towards the end of the um, second season, but mostly just, like, to scan stuff and use a force field, this and that. Um, she's only really given, like, laser gauntlets one time when she has to rescue Sarge from um, this one dude who has, like, a map of the entire underground and she cannot shoot to save her life <laughs> now she does end up falling in love with a guy who's kind of like part of the cdc down there basically it's like this a huge epidemic happened that wiped out half of the underworld so they create the bureau of something something similar to the cdc where anybody with a cold will get arrested and but they pretty much disappeared that organization until they started like sniffing out thaws they feel like if you're a thaw from like whatever part of the century um before then you will carry diseases and that will infect the underworld and stuff and so she ended up falling in love with the dude who's supposed to take her in and everything and um capture her and everything and she's played by jennifer sky who appeared in xena as an Amazon or a pretend Amazon. Now, Danielle Cormack, she of course played Ephany and Xena. And so she played Raina in Cleopatra 2525. Raina was a former like lab experiment of the voice. And so, and gave her somehow psionic powers, but she had, she can control like people's like minds and read people's minds and stuff. She is a villain for sure who wants to destroy voice and all her teams and align herself with Baileys and control them. And so Cleopatra is always the one who ends up defeating Reyna because she's always taking control of the other girls and stuff. And so Reyna was a really fun villain. It was nice to see Danielle act like differently and stuff. And so basically that's really all her character. She just kept trying to mind control people. Now Joel, um, Joel Tobak, 
he plays Cregan. Now, he's best known for playing Strife and Hercules. And so he is the main arch nemesis of that of Hal. He dresses like uh, the Joker, but in all red. And he hates the voice. He hates the people in the underground. He wants the Baileys to destroy like the world and everything. And so it is later revealed that he did not kill Hal's dad. But then when he found Hal's dad, he later really did kill him and stuff. So it turns out in the very final episode, when he's supposed to be executed, the voice goes to him as a confessor disguised in a, a different form. And he confesses everything, but then he knows it's her and everything. And she wants to know who created the Baileys. And he reveals it was him. He's a thaw. He came from sometime in the year after Cleo, like after Cleopatra was um, thaw um, or frozen. He was later frozen. See, what happened was he created the Baileys as being a means to clean up society and stuff like that. Um, to end the crap that humanity does or whatever. Uh, basically, I think that's supposed to be like sanitation or something like that. But the Baileys started having a mind of their own. And they realized to sanitize the world, they'll have to sanitize those that plague the world, which is humanity and stuff. At some point in time, he uh, froze himself and then he doesn't know why the Baileys don't remember him, but they literally don't. For some bizarre reason, he decided to dress like as a clown after he got thawed out and was hooking up with a voice and stuff. He later, later turned to evil and decided, you know, look, the Baileys are going to be on the winning team, so I need to be on their team. So he decided to dress like the Joker and for some bizarre reason. <laughs> And decided to align himself with like evil and stuff like that. And because his last name is actually Bailey, so he named him after him. So, after knowing this and everything, Voice has decided, well, it's time to put an end to Cregan, and she executes him and everything. And then the final battle actually happens. Now, Elizabeth Hawthorne, she plays the Voice. She appeared as Hercules' mom at one point in time. And, so she's just pretty much this mysterious voice that contacts the other like team leaders and had them go on like missions and this and that. We don't know why she decided to save the underworld, but apparently something just made her so fed up that she decided she has to be the one to take these things down. We never get to see her years ago when she met uh, Cregan and stuff. Um, there's a younger actress who was in the photograph and then so the oldest one is one we see now and so the thing about her she's kind of like professor x she's good but a little shady and everything she will literally do whatever it takes to get the job done even if it means taking out one of her own team members and stuff and she's very secretive of her secrets so this was a really fun show and it had really strong female like empowerment and stuff. And you know, it, it, it is a rip off of the matrix sadly, but it was fun. You know what I'm saying? Like this is just a really fun show and it's on DVD. I'm not sure if it's on streaming or not. You have to go check that out. But yeah, it was a really fun high octane show. Happy Women's History Month, everybody. All right, I'll talk to you later. Bye.